Well, Jay and Warren, thank you very much for, for coming by, and uh, thank you for the facilities, Warren. Uh, you two are unique. Even though you're in different spheres, you've reached a level of success, almost legendary. Uh, what did you do? What made you different? Warren, we'll start with you, because they're in investing. There are a lot of bright people. They've all claimed to read Graham and Dodd. Uh, <laughs> they all claim to be disciplined, and yet there's only one Warren Buffett. Well, I was lucky that I got started early. I mean, it always helps if you get started early. And, and, and my dad happened to be in the investment business, so I would go down to his office on Saturdays. And so at age probably seven or something, I started reading these books that were around the place. And so I had a 15-year jump on many people, in a, in a sense. And that, that helped a lot. And, and I was always fascinated by them. I knew what I wanted to do early. And I think that's a, that's a huge advantage, too. And then you don't need it. You don't need a lot of brains in this business. I mean, I've always said if you got an IQ of 160, give away 30 points to somebody else because you don't need it in investments. What you do need is emotional stability. You have to, you have to be able to think independently, and you have to be, you have to be, when you come to a conclusion, you have to really not care what other people say and 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 just follow the facts and follow your reasoning. And and that's that's tough for a lot of people. But, uh, that part, I, I think, I was just lucky with. I was born that way. In terms of uh, emotions, it's uh, a truism that investing emotions are your enemy. Absolutely. That uh, when the market's good, if you feel good, don't. If you feel bad, you should probably do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but uh, how, uh, how, how did you, uh, what, what was that extra thing where uh, so many will acknowledge that, and yet we saw in the current crisis, they, they panicked while you went into seemingly uh, potential disasters like GE and uh, Goldman Sachs. Yeah. I can't really tell you the answer. I mean, I didn't learn in school or anything. I just, it never bothered me if people disagreed with what I thought, uh, as long as I felt I knew the facts. I mean, I, there's a whole bunch of things I don't know a thing about. I just stay away from those. Uh, so I stay within what I call my circle of competence. You know, that uh, Tom Watson said it best. He said, you know, he said, he said, I'm no genius, but I'm smart in spots, and I stay around those spots. Well, I try and stay around those spots, and I, I just don't have a a problem if if uh, if somebody says you know you're wrong on something I just I go back and look at the facts and and, and it, I think that I think that really is much more important frankly than than having a few points of IQ or or having an extra course or two in in school or anything of the sort you need emotional stability and so uh, in terms of uh, people who are not even in the business if they uh, I think we were talking uh, when we had dinner the other day about how in tennis, most of us are never going to get to Wimbledon. Uh, but if we just focus, as somebody once said, get the ball over the net. Don't try to be fancy about it. Just get the ball over the net. You'll do fine. Yeah, and that's a little bit like I've got this rule. You know, the first rule is don't lose, and the second rule is never forget the first rule. So it really isn't so much having a lot of brilliant decisions. It's just not really having some terrible ones. And 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 frankly, I did learn from Ben Graham how to avoid ever having any disasters in investments. Uh, it, it wasn't that you were going to come up with the very smartest thing, but if you never have any, any significant losses, you know, some singles and doubles will produce a lot of runs before you get through. Who was Ben Graham? He, he was your primary mentor, model? He was a wonderful man, and he was my professor at Columbia. I read his book when I was 19 at the University of Nebraska. And, I'd started investing when I was 11, and I started reading about it when I was like seven. So I'd gone through all, I read every book in the Omaha Public Library that there was on, by the time I was 12, on, on investing in stock market. And I had a lot of fun, but I never really found out, I never got grounded in anything. And it, it, was, it was entertaining, but it wasn't going to be profitable. And then I read Graham's book, The Intelligent Investor, when I was at the University of Nebraska. And it pulled that it just together. opened the whole thing up to me. Yeah, and I, and I named my, my oldest son is named Howard after my dad, Graham Buffett, and, and he was a marvelous man. Never expected anything from me in return. He just did all these things for younger people. You have just a couple of quick examples of uh, the things that he did that you uh, will look back on. It's one thing to read something, but quite another to see it in action. Well, he, but what he, what he did was he got me thinking not as a stock, as something with a ticker symbol that wiggles around and that you, know, that you look at charts on or anything. He, he, he taught me to think about it as part of the business. And, and that was vital. And, he, and, he, and he, he taught me not to really pay any attention to stock market fluctuations except when they were working in my favor. So that not to get you know, elated because something had gone up or depressed because it went down. So 
if I knew the facts on something and it went down, I bought more of it, you know, and, and uh, because I looked at it as a business. And then, so, and then, he, then, he, then he taught that famous lesson about a margin of safety, that you don't drive a truck that weighs 9,900 pounds across a bridge that says limit 10,000 pounds because you can't be that sure about it. If you see something like that, you go down a little further down the road and you find one that says limit 20,000 pounds and that's the one you drive across. So he, in effect, taught you that uh, stocks weren't just numbers. Numbers that's were right. shorthand for flesh and blood businesses. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. very easy to overlook. I've never forgotten it. <laughs> Jay, you uh, are in a business that's perhaps even more competitive because there's probably not a young person in the country who at some point in their lives wants to be an entertainer, a star. Right. And you have not only have done it, but you've done it consistently. And even though you're only 40 going on 41, in that business, that's, uh, that's almost like 80 in Warren's world, it, it's tough to do more than one or two. Uh, what, what, how, looking back, what were the things that uh, broke you out of the pack in the most dramatic way possible. When I was, as I was listening to him, I, I, I just hear, I see, hear all the similarities and all the uh, themes in, in what he's saying, right? Because if you don't look at it as uh, tickers and things like that, you're really just searching for the truth within, you know, all that. And within all the numbers and all the chaos, you're just searching for the truth, right? And that's the key to being a recording artist, right? But you're, you're telling your story or finding your truth at the moment. You know, I, I, I had, mine's a little opposite from Warren because I started a little later. My first album didn't come out until I was 26, so I had a, like a bit more maturity of, of where I was at. It's my, my first album had all these, um, you know, emotions and complexities and layers to them that um, a typical hip hop album didn't have because, you know, we were making it at 16, 17 years old. It wasn't enough wealth of experience to share with the world. So at 26, I had been through so many different things. I had so much wealth to share um, you know, with the world at that time. And from that starting point, I've never forgotten those things. Like you said, I mean, you never forget those true things that you stick to, your basic things that, that uh, you know, make you successful. And, and, and for me, it's that truth, finding that truth, the truth of the moment of where I am at the time. You know, not trying to um, uh, cater to a certain demographic, you know, or, you know, not being something I'm not, not driving a truck over a bridge, 10,000, you, you know, the whole thing. Like, there's so many similarities in, in uh, what he was just saying. Now, in terms of a mentor, you uh, mentioned at a young age, you got a love of words. How, how you meant, and uh, before we recorded, you mentioned a sixth grade teacher brought yeah. that out in you that's lived a lifetime. Yeah, I was telling you early, like in, um, you know, our classrooms where we grew up, I grew up in Marcy Projects in Brooklyn, and, um, you know, our classrooms were flooded, you know, so it's very difficult for teachers to give you, like, like one-on-one uh, -on -one attention, you know, and there's just one sixth grade teacher, her name was Miss Loudon, you know, she must have saw something in me, and she gave me this attention, and she gave me um, this love for words, you know, um, it's funny how it works, you know, it's, you know, work for me to this day. But um, just a little bit of attention, you know, um, and she also took us on a field trip to a house, you know, which opened me up to the world. You know, my neighborhood had been my world. It's the only thing I'd seen, you know. Uh, you know, I just you know, saw a whole different world. My imagination grew from there. You know, I wanted that. I aspired to have that, you know. It was a small thing, she had like a, a ice thing on her refrigerator. You know, you push the ice and the water come down. I was really amazed by that. I was like, I want one of those. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Now, uh, uh, you also, uh, even though you didn't record your first album until you were 26, you, uh, in effect, were writing music in your own mind. Yeah, I was around music my whole life. My mom and pop had, like, a huge record collection, so I started out listening to... Uh, uh, music r early on, and I would just write music, and um, you know I just had a love from it, f you know, from there. And, um, I didn't get to it, you know. I, I got caught into my neighborhood and my surroundings, but um, I've always taken it with me, and I've always went back to it. And then just got to a point where it was like, make this decision. Is this is something? Th this something you really love and you love to do? Is you know, it's time to really focus on it and to get serious about it, and you know give it your all. And once I, you know, I did that, it was no looking back from there. 
And uh, you were able to overcome where, where you grew up, as you once put it. You saw what happened and things like drug dealing, yeah. where, where the life would end, and you decided at some point, I'm not going there. Yeah, just, I mean, you know, those sort of decisions that happen in, you know, many of our lives, you know, when we have, we're faced with that, those fork, you know, the fork in the road moments, um, you know, and I was around people and I was seeing people, really genuinely nice people going away for 13 years and, you know, all these, uh, you know, unjust and Rockefeller laws and, you know, I was just around that so much that I would just told myself, man, I have to make a decision at some point. And, um, you know, I made this, this, this decision to, uh, you know, focus on music, which was my love, you know, and it, and it, it worked out. Uh, consistency. You know, uh, people have a love of music. They may do one or two or three albums, and then for some reason they fade away. That hasn't happened to you. I think, it's, again, again, it goes back to a, a bit of what Warren was saying as well. Like, it's the discipline as well, the discipline to not get caught up in the moment. You know, music is like stocks too. You know, there's the hot thing of the moment. You know, there's this hot electro sound or the hot auto-tuned voice or the hot uh, whatever, whatever's new and exciting. And you know, you know, people tend to make emotional decisions based on that. They don't stick with what they know. This is who I am. This is, you know, this is what I do. And then they, you know, jump on this next hot thing, and you know, it's it's not for you. So for me, just having the discipline and having the confidence that, it, it, and who I am, you know. And if I go into a studio and and if I find my truth of the moment, there 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 are a number of people in the world that can relate to what I'm saying, and and it's gonna um, buy into what I'm doing. You know, not because it's the new thing of the moment, but because it's my genuine emotions. It's how I feel. It's how I articulate the world. And, you know, just having the discipline to just, you know, be yourself. Because you once said, as an artist, you are fighting against everything that's new and everyone's fascinations with new things. Yeah, shiny things. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> people fall in love with shiny things. <laughs> so, 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 in essence, so in essence, as you grow older, you bring an audience with you because the right. topic of your music grows with you. Right, right. So I it mean, never stays. Does doesn't go stale. Yeah, because for, for hip hop is like thirty years old. Like hip hop is fairly a new genre of music. So we've never seen, uh, you know, the maturation of hip hop you know, in this sort of way. This never happened before. You know, people would get a certain age and still try to pinpoint this, you know, young demographic because hip hop was a young man's sport. But, you know, people that listen to hip hop when they're 18, they still don't like hip hop when they're 28. It's just that the, the voices in hip hop are not speaking directly to them anymore. Weren't, you know, they weren't. They were speaking to a 18 year old demographic, you know, so you know, you're 28, you don't have anything to listen to because no one's relating to you. So, you know, my whole thing was, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm just going to make, you know, the music that I love to make and that I want to make and I'm going to mature with my music and, you know, luckily for me, it was the right decision. When did you realize that not only did you have this uh, ability with music and not to get stale, but recognize too, you have to be treat it also, even though you love it, as a business so that you don't end up, as so many do, they lose everything they have, they're in effect indentured to companies, and uh, they're, they're not masters of their fate. Yeah, that was the greatest trick in music that people ever pulled off, is to convince artists that you can't be an artist and make money. <laughs> I, I think the people that were making millions actually set that. <laughs> I think they set that whole thing up. You know, it was almost like shameful, like especially in rock and roll. You had to pretend that, you know, you got these millionaire guys who had to pretend as if they weren't successful at all or it would be like a detriment to their career. You know, um, hip hop from the beginning, you know, just it was always been aspirational, you know, just always broke that thing you know, that thing that an artist can't think as well. And um, I think at the end of the day, as long as you, when you separate the two, and you're not making music with business in mind, because you, you, at some point you have, it has to be real when they touch it, when they listen to it. 
you know, something has to resonate with them that's real. As long as you, when you're in the studio, you're, you're an artist, you make music, and then after you finish, you, you market it to the world, I don't think anything is wrong with that. In fact, I know there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and um, So how, uh, just, uh, going right from the very beginning, you learned about the business of music because uh, you couldn't well, we were that. forced. Yeah, we were. Yes, <laughs> we were forced in the beginning. I wish I could say we were geniuses and say we're going to start our own company. You know, I, that's not what happened. You know, in the beginning, we went to every single label, and every single label shut their door on us. Um, the the genius thing that we did was we didn't give up. We didn't say because these guys, you know, we use that what do they know approach. You know, we we didn't give up at that point. I think that would. You know, that was the genius thing we did. We started selling our own CDs, and we built our own buzz, and then the record company came back to us. So now we had um, uh, a different negotiation. You know, it wasn't the same artist um, label relationship. Now we retain ownership in our own company, and uh, it was the best thing for us, you know. Well, one of the things you did uh, fairly recently was about three years ago, uh, you were with a company, you were president of a company, you saw firsthand what you thought was wrong with the music business, you wanted out, and you're willing to put money to get yourself out. Yeah, I didn't necessarily want out. I wanted to work with them, but I wanted like a, a fund, uh, in a sense. You were president of the company? Yeah, I was the president of Def Jam Records, and I wanted, a, I wanted a fund to, you know, I wanted to work there. Because what, 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 what struck to, you is they take all these artists almost like throwing them against the wall so you see which ones would stick. You thought that was a yeah, huge waste of money. Yeah, in the music business for a long time, the, the, a hit record solved all your problems because there wasn't the internet and there wasn't this uh, YouTube and there wasn't so many other factors. It was just the music. So that model still exists of, you know, just putting artists out and see what works, you know, uh, and as the machine stopped moving faster. A lot of things got lost in uh, the process, you know, A&R and, &R and, and uh, letting the artist, artist development, you know. So it got to a point we were, as a music business, we were releasing hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of albums every year. And, you know, the percentages was like really low, like 56 albums and four artists work, or, you know, something like that. So I wanted to bring, you know, the entire culture uh, into it. I, I wanted a fund so I could do other things aside from si signing artists like, you know, buy a television station or buy a club that, you know, we can develop these artists in or, you know, buy some headphones. Uh, you know, it's just all these different things I wanted to do and uh, I don't think um, at that time, you know, they could really get their mind around it. Um, it's not something they were willing to do. And, you know, I just felt like I would, I would be a waste there. So, you know, I started my own thing, Rock Nation, and, you know, that's what we do. We pretty much, we have everything from, uh, it's a publishing company, you know, we have writers, you know, it's a recording company, we have, uh, it's a touring company, it's... Um, Did you have sleepless there? nights when you put, what was it, $5 million to buy out the con your last contract for an album? Yeah, at the end of that, my death, yeah, very much so. <laughs> I even have a better story for you. Uh, so my last year of Def Jam, you know, when I proposed this and it didn't work, you know, I, st I went over to sign with a group called Live Nation and made Rock Nation, but that was me as a businessman. As an artist, I still had one album left with uh, Def Jam and Universal. And I went to uh, Doug Morris and you know, L.A. Reid, who was the uh, chairman of Def Jam at the time, you know, he did a great thing for me. He allowed me to, you know, walk in and have the conversation with Doug. And Doug, you know, we had a fantastic relationship, so it was very cool. But I, um, I bought my last album back. And what people don't know about is the day I, I had flew in from Hawaii, I was doing some recording, and I had an iPod in my pocket, and I was on a, a commercial flight coming from um, Hawaii to New York, and I had on uh, jogging pants, and I'm my iPod with all the music that I recorded was missing. It was on a plane somewhere. Oh. So I had to walk into the office the next day and buy an album back that might leak the next day. <laughs> so every day I would wake up and I, I would check all the internet places and everywhere <laughs> and be like, for, yeah, for like three months. I, 
<laughs> you, but I, I, you know, at the end of the day, it was it was worth it. You know, just, you know, I was heading in a different direction, and just that freedom, and it turned out to be a great decision for me. It was a great decision for the company. They got some money, and you know, great decision for me. Got a um, very successful album, The Blueprint Three, and you know, which had Empire State of Mind on it, was sold about you know, four million singles itself and which, you know which, which someday may become the anthem for New York. Yeah. Actually my first number one record was off I mean as a solo artist, mm -hmm. you know, I had number ones is uh collaborate with collaborators, but my first number one across the board album um record came off that album. So it was like really good time for me. And I think and I believe in, you know, everything aligning up. So I think it happened at that time for the right reason. That leads to, uh, you mentioned things line up, luck. We, we all know hard work's essential, discipline's essential, staying power's essential, but there's that element there that you can't quantify, but you know it's there. Warren, you, you, you've had some thoughts. Well, there's a lot of luck. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, just being born in the United States in 1930, the odds were like 30 to 1 against me. I mean, you know, it, uh, uh, I didn't have anything to do with picking the United States <laughs> as I emerged. And having decent genes for certain things. And in my own case, I was sort of wired for capital allocation. And being wired for capital allocation a couple of hundred years ago in Nebraska wouldn't have meant a thing. Uh, and, and even now being born in various parts of the world, it wouldn't have meant much. But here I was in this soon to be very rich capitalistic system. And, and it just so happened that what I did paid off enormously in a market system like we have. And I, if I'd had a talent in some other area that was way less commercial. I mean, I would, have, I would have had a good time doing it, but it wouldn't have paid off like this. But of course, Jay said it perfectly when he talked about, you know, he's in there recording for himself and the money comes afterwards. I mean, I, I got to do what I love. I mean, and it doesn't get any luckier than that. If, 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 if you can spend your lifetime, right. and I'm 80 now, and doing things you love every single day. I mean, I, I would be doing what I did, what I do now, and I would have done it in the past. If the payoff had been in seashells or shark teeth or anything else, it, it, if you can go to work every morning, I tap dance to work, you know, and I come down and I, I every day's exciting. Uh, so that is lucky. I mean, that didn't have to happen that way. If I'd been born in 1930, if I'd been born a female, if I'd been born black, I would not have had the same opportunities that, that I had. I mean, I, it's just, it's chance. I mean, I, uh, my, my parents love my sisters just as much as they love me. My sisters are just as smart or smarter than I am and all of that, but they didn't have the same expectations. Uh, in the 30s for, a, for a, a young, smart girl, for a young, smart guy. And so I, I've had all kinds of luck. I had the luck of, I got turned down by Harvard. Well, getting turned on down by Harvard, then I got to study under Ben Graham at Columbia, which changed my life. I, all kinds of things have worked out. So I just hope I stay lucky. <laughs> I've been lucky for 80 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, uh, where, where you grew up, you could have easily have uh, yeah. ended up, as you discussed with your friends who uh, did something and by golly, they, they were put away and didn't get yeah. the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, there are very few people that from my neighborhood, you know, in my environment that make it out, uh, I mean, forget about being, to be successful, to make it out alive, you know, or, or, or to be um, incarcerated, you know, for the, I'm, I have a great friend, you know, who just came home, who's one of the most beautiful people you ever meet, you know, and he's, you know, he just came home from doing 13 years, and we were we were together every single day. You know, and had it not been for music and um, music taking me out, you know, at the right time, you know, my life could very easily have been his. Very easily, we were together every single day. Well, men mention you know. the story about London. You yeah. So um, they they did. You know, we were into different things. We were into a lot of. Uh, street things and um, you know just so happened I had a talent to make music and um, a guy by the name of Jazz um, who I started out with really early you know he got a, the opportunity he got to deal with EMI he had the opportunity to go to London to record um, his album and uh, you know I went along with him and we, we waited for two months well in that two months there was a sting operation and he took, you know, my friend I'm talking about, took him away for 13 years. And the only reason I was in there, because I was away, you know, uh, doing this music stuff. Amazing. Uh, business models, we, we've touched on it, that uh, just because you've done something right before with a music business, they're accustomed to doing things a certain way, 
world changes, they can't adjust. Uh, Warren, uh, what advice do you have? You've seen it in the newspaper business. You made yeah. your name. Washington Post, Buffalo News, right. legalized monopoly, 30 IQ, you could put them in those businesses and they'd succeed. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, and then now, now they're uh, it happens. crashing. It happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, street railways were big here almost 100 years ago. I, the, uh, but I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. I mean, that doesn't mean that industries stay good forever or businesses stay good forever. But but learning to think about business models, what I learned at 20 is useful to me now. What I learned at 25 is useful to me now. And so it's not, it's not, so, it's not a field that changes dramatically in terms of the underlying principles. It's like physics. I mean, there's underlying principles. Now, they're doing all kinds of things with physics they weren't doing 50 years ago. But, but if, if you've know if, if you got the principles, if you know what makes a good business, if you know what makes a good manager, you know, if you know what makes a, a, a good product, uh, and you learn that in one business, you can, there is some transference to other businesses if you go along. And you learn what things you, you're not going to understand. I mean, knowing what to leave out is just as important as knowing what to focus on. <laughs> and uh, I don't think I can win every game. You know, somebody said, how do you beat Bobby Fischer? You play him any game except chess. <laughs> so I don't play Bobby <laughs> Fischer chess. <laughs> and that's, there's a lot of value to learning that over time and, and, and learning what you're good at and what you're not good at. <laughs> and uh, Jay, uh, your business is like the, in the newspaper business. You, you yourself have said that uh, record companies are an anachronistic, that they, they, they lost it. They lost it with Napster. Explain how they did it and what you learned from it and how you think you can go forward and survive in an environment where what would have been true for decades is no longer true. Yeah, I think that's the, a big thing about uh, a business is recognizing change. You know, you know that the, the um, variables are not the same. You know, there's a big thing called the internet, so it changes the landscape for everything. I think the consumption of music is, a, is at an all-time high, um, but as we see, the music business is down. So something has to be done there. You know, it was a time in, in, in music where a hit solved everything. You just had a hit, it didn't matter what was going on. You know, get a hit and, you know, it solved everyone's problem. Covered a lot of sense. You know, that's, that's, that's no longer true. Not today. And. Um, I think, you know, just having that mentality for so long, um, uh, I think it's the music business is still stuck in that place because, I mean, you know, we, we you haven't mean, figured you, that you, we you haven't figured that, it out. That, that Napster, they made a huge mistake on Napster. Yeah, well, Napster came along and uh, there was this file sharing thing and um, at the time we had, we had the opportunity to embrace it and this way you can control it. It was one place. But when you stop one nap, when you stop Napster and we shut down Napster, um, just the arrogance that we had, um, it made a million Napsters. Now it's impossible to control. Um, you know, just just that sort of thinking. You know, I, I, I think in business, one, one of the biggest things is to open yourself up for change. You don't have to change who you are and how you operate, but just, you know, you know if the landscape has changed, then the way we do business has to change somewhat. We don't have to change who we are. We have to change the way we go about it. Because like I said, the consumption of music is higher than ever. Well, you've uh, done it in your own music. As you've gotten older, you've brought audiences with you and others have not. What are you uh, doing in terms of the model that's been shattered in music? You mentioned when you left the record label company, you saw you had to do certain things. How are you uh, recreating a, a well, model that for can one work we're in the taking future? our time with with you know artists uh, and uh, artist development. For two, there's just so many different uh, parts of the uh, business that we're in. You know, it, for a long time, music um, wasn't into uh, touring. You know, now they they're making up these 360. Uh, I don't want this to be like a record company bashing thing. Now they're doing this. this <laughs> they whole, bash themselves. You can, yeah. you, you can do it now. Yeah. You could have done it 20 yeah. years ago. Yeah. <laughs> this whole 360 model, and it's like, you don't, that's not what, you, you know, the record company does. The record company is not in the touring business, so why would an artist sign you a rights um, to you and that's not what you do? That's not your a area expertise, you know, but we're, we, you know, we're, we're with the biggest, uh, concert promoted it is. So there's, 
you know, we're into publishing. There's just so many different aspects of music. We're, we're, in, we're into more of it now, and we're, um, you know, we're getting better at it. You know, just to open up different avenues, you know, to make ourselves successful. So touring clothing and touring also clothing, uh, movies, uh, publishing, uh, you know, just. I don't want to compete thing. with him, Steve. No, I'm not interested yet. <laughs> <laughs> but and then, then on uh, the, the tours, you are uh, wise enough or big enough or something where you don't mind sharing billing with Eminem or Bono. Yeah, it's, it's fun for me, for one, and for two, like we were saying in the car, like, you know, one plus one is three for me. You know, I don't have that ego where I, you know, I have to be the only guy on the bill or the only one that people look at. You know, I'm I'm, I'm cool with going out um, with, other, with other artists. I've been doing it my entire career. You know, before Eminem, before Bono, it was, you know, R. Kelly and or 50 Cent or, you know, uh, DMX. You know, I've been doing it my entire career. I just believe that, you know, the, the giving people a better package, you know, that when they leave the concert hall, they want to come back again. You know, you can get them there the first time. You know, if, if what you're putting on is not incredible and um, impactful, then how they, why would they come back the second time? You know, I think that's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people make that mistake, you know, when they're hot at the moment. You know, they just sell them, you know, they, 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 they sell off the name and sell off the moment. Yeah, that, the shiny things. You fall in love with right. shiny things. You sell off the moment, and then when people come to the concert, they don't have the experience. Well, we're over-delivering on the experience. You know, you're not only getting Eminem, you're getting Eminem and Jay-Z. You're not only getting Bono, you're getting Bono and Jay-Z. You can't help but leave that um, concert, you know, with a, almost like a once-in-a-lifetime experience every single time. That's what I'm trying to create. Oh, well, Warren, you said you wouldn't want to compete against Jay, uh, what advice would you... He's super duper joking. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> what, 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 what advice would you have for a, a man who's succeeded in a business where it's often short-lived, being convulsed? Uh, how, how do you, you like to have businesses where you say there's a moat where the competitors can't get you? Hmm. What advice would you give on Jay get building moats? Well, he's building moats, I mean, all the time. I mean, obviously, uh, and that's why he's succeeding, even though he's moved beyond the age that you normally associate his field with. So uh, the best moat you can have is your own talent. You know, I mean, it's, they, can't, they can't take it away from you. They, inflation can't take it from you. Right. Taxes can't take it from you. So I, I, when I talk to students, I see these students and I tell them, you know, you're a million dollar asset. I would pay you $100,000, the MBAs, for 10% of the earnings for the rest of your life. So that makes you a million dollar asset. Now, if you can do something to increase that value 50%, if you can learn to communicate better verbally or in written form, and you become 50% more, that's $500,000 just by improving yourself. I mean, not, nobody can take that away from you. And, and so I urge everybody, you know, when they're, I talk to them in high school about this and, 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 and colleges, just do, Develop, develop the habits. You've got the brain power, you've got the energy, but develop the habits of success. And, and look around you at the people that you admire, you know, and list what makes you admire them compared to somebody else that looks equally strong or equally uh, talented. And those are, those are things that you can do. I mean, just write them down. And, and, and uh, you know, people like people that are, they're, they like them if they're, if they're humorous, if they're friendly, if they're, if they're, uh, if they give credit to the other fellow. I mean. I, and, and they don't like them if they're stingy, you know, or they overstate and overpromise and all those sort of things. Well, that's, decision, that's a decision you make. So, so I, I encourage everybody to build your own moat around yourself. Jay, you have any I, advice you want to give to Warren on building moats? Uh, I mean, what am I going to say to this guy, man? <laughs> <laughs> he can do things I can't do, believe me. I can't do anything. <laughs> He's a brilliant thinker. <laughs> Well, this uh, then gets uh, to uh, what is money for? You've, uh, you've greatly succeeded. You haven't made the mistakes that others made to get a success, and then you let it destroy your discipline. Uh, in terms of uh, there are only so many steaks we can eat or hamburgers or whatever, uh, the, the value added, we'll start with you, Warren, maybe we can start this part of the conversation. The value added you always had was you could employ capital 
multiply it, which meant more businesses, more uh, people for pensions, more hiring. Uh, that was a great uh, service. That was doing a real public good. Yet a few years ago, you decided uh, you were going to do something in, in addition to multiplying capital, which meant opportunity and a higher standard of living. Well, Steve, if you go back, at really when I was in my 20s, I mean, I, I, it sounds obnoxious, but I really did know I was going to become rich. I mean, because <laughs> I just I'd learned something that, that was going to work. And, and uh, my wife and I decided then, I mean, she was 100% on board, my first wife, and, and, uh, on this, and we, we were going to enjoy life. We are going to have everything possibly use or need. But incidentally, I, I think a $5 dinner in many cases is better than a $100 dinner. So same I don't, with, I think, with I, wine, too. Yeah, cost of living <laughs> and, and standard of living are not necessarily the same. But I thought I would compound money at a rate above, well above average. And, and, and we decided we'd live well. We never denied ourselves anything. It meant independence so I could do what I wanted to do. And, 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 and then I felt one way or another we'd uh, it, it, it would go back to society. Now, I thought my wife would outlive me. She was a little younger, and women live longer than men. And she, she loved the actual process of, of seeing people with problems that money would help. And I loved, I loved the game I was in. So I thought we wouldn't, you know, basically we'd pile it up, and she would do the distribution of it. And, and she did a lot of it while she was alive, but the big money was going to be later on. And then she died while I was still alive, and then I had to make a decision as to the best way to get this money spent in an intelligent way, relatively promptly, uh, and I came up with the idea of splitting among five foundations, the largest of which is the Gates Foundation. And that was four years ago, and I couldn't be more pleased with the decision. I haven't denied myself anything. I mean, I, I, I eat everything I want. I travel any place I want. Have, have you denied society something that the capital, if you keep employing it, might have done more good? In well, uh, the, the Berkshire's still around. I'm still running it. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm yeah, just, not I'm, doing I'm, so I, bad. I, I, I'm making, I'm making, I'm making it still for the, the charities, but I'm making it for a lot of other people yeah. too. You know, I, so I didn't have to give up anything. I didn't even, you know, I didn't have to give up what I love doing every day. I didn't have to give up any material thing in the world, and and my three children are each involved with a foundation which lets them put money behind their energies. And no, I think it it's really worked out wonderfully for me. I mean, it's a, been a perfect solution, and you know. When my wife was pregnant, I didn't think I was going to deliver a baby, you know. And and you know, if I get a, a toothache or something, I don't take out my own tooth. I, I turn it over. I, I follow Adam Smith's advice, you know. I turn it over to a specialist. And there's no reason to think that because I'm good at making money, that I would be the best necessarily at, at distributing it. I, I I want certain goals in terms of how it's distributed, but I'm perfectly willing to turn it over to people who are going to spend their lives specializing in that. I want them to get it done promptly. Uh, and I want it to be in sync with the kind of things I want to uh, I want to support, but I don't think I have to do it myself. Now, uh, in terms of that, uh, many times a foundation gets set up, and it, it, it's this goes off in a different direction. And, 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 and uh, there's a thing called Parkinson's law that an organization becomes self-centered, in for itself, and forgets its purpose that it was created for. I see it all uh, the time. And uh, you see it in business. That's why they go broke oftentimes. But in foundations, you see it. So you uh, made a provision that that was not going to happen with your funds. Yeah. They, they had to be, those monies had to be employed, what, within 10 years? 10 years after my, my state's completed, yeah. And, and the money has to all be spent. It can't go to institutions which in turn put it in their endowment or anything like that. I, I want people that I know and I, I know are in sync with me and I know will be true to certain ideals. I want them to dispense it because who the hell knows 50 years from now, you know, when the place becomes some large institution, what will happen? People will rationalize then that what's good for the institution is exactly what old Warren thought, you know, 40 years ago on his deathbed. So I've seen that happen too often. And, and uh, uh, now I, the foundations are not tested by a market system. I mean, if, if you've got a business idea and he's got music, it's being tested by a market system. By the, People will make a decision with whether that next next album is good, and they'll make a decision, you know, on, on whether Coca-Cola still keeps them happy and all that sort of thing. A foundation has no market test, so it's very easy if there's not a market test, as people will find out in government and other places. It's very easy to start rationalizing things that are a long way from what you originally people thought you were setting out to do. And uh, you were in terms of uh, you're just beginning uh, looking at uh, charities. And uh, you have a very unusual one 
uh, scholarship fund, Sean Carter Scholarship Fund. Describe it, and where do you think uh, you, you, you see it going? Yeah, for me, yeah, that, uh, uh, the reason I focused on that, because such a small thing changed my life, right? A, a sixth grade teacher said, you know what, you're kind of smart. And I, and, I, and I believed her. I said, I'm smart, right? So she gave me that sort of opportunity. She sparked the idea in my mind. So that's why my first thing is uh, the scholarship fund, because there are a ton of uh, very intelligent kids that's coming out of these urban areas who, who can make it all the way if given the opportunity. And um, so it's a challenge that I uh, gave to my mom, and my mom is so involved with it. Like she, she gets on the bus and she takes these kids to their um, um, to interview with colleges, and you know now we're starting to see kids graduate from college, and you know that sort of feeling, you know, when it's real, you know, it's, I'm not just sitting home writing a check and, you know, for whatever reason, to make myself feel good or anything like this. It's something that I really want to do and I'm really, um, you know, into and excited about. So, um, oh, it's, it's effective philanthropy, in other words. Right. And, I mean, and, yeah, and, and I'm, uh, I'm seeing the results. I'm seeing, you know, we've getting our first graduates from the Sean Carter Scholarship Program, which is, like, for me, the best thing ever. And, uh, uh, it seems like a contradiction. Uh, when you think of commerce, it's uh, meeting the needs and wants of others. You provide the music, people like it. You do well, they get the pleasure. More on investment returns, good companies. And, uh, but yet in philanthropy, if you think about it, it's almost the same opposite side of the same coin, meeting the needs and wants of others. A little different way of doing it. But again, uh, as you say, it's not just writing a check, it's making sure it's actually delivering what it's supposed to deliver. Right. Yeah. It's tougher than business, too, Steve, because you're looking for easy things to do in business. I mean, you're looking, you know, people have liked drinking Coca-Cola for 100 years. They'll probably like it for another 100 years. It doesn't require any great grain power to figure that kind of thing out. But in philanthropy, often you're, tougher, you're, you're tackling the tougher problems of society. You're, you're tacking, tackling things where people have applied money and intelligence before and haven't really solved the problem. I mean, education is a great right. example. So you're really taking on things where you're not going to succeed every time. And if you like succeeding every time, it's, you, know, you, have to get, you have to adjust to that. You, if you succeed 100% of the time in philanthropy, the projects are too easy. And you, 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 you've got to look for, for things that are important and where you may fail. Uh, right now, Gates is working on polio eradicating. They, they've got 99% of the way there. But the last 1% is very tough, and nobody knows for sure whether that will get done. Uh, you know, we did it with smallpox in the past, and, and so it—it's a different mindset, uh, uh, and and you don't get that, the same uh, feedback you get in business either immediately. Well, that uh, gets also to a universal thing: learning from mistakes. One of the things you do in your annual report, which has become a classic, is you will discuss what went wrong, like Dexter, and what you learned, and, how. <laughs> and, 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 and and what you learned from it. Sure. Tough, tough to do. Well, it's, it's, it's very important to recognize mistakes. I mean, if, if somebody goes around and says, you know, I never made a mistake, I mean, you quit listening to them. I mean, you know, they're in a dream right. world. So, right. so facing up to it, uh, it it's, it's a little like in, in, in terms of discussing issues. You should be able to discuss the other fellow's position just as well as you can discuss your own. So, I mean, that's part of thinking well. And, and certainly part of making good decisions in business is recognizing the poor decisions you've made and, and why they were poor. And, and, and that doesn't mean you never do the same thing. I mean, it, it, because sometimes it was a, a freak situation. But, but I have made lots of mistakes. I'm going to make more mistakes. Uh, but, you know, Babe Ruth struck out a lot of times. I mean, it, it's the name of the game that you do it. it you don't want to expect perfection in yourself. You, you want to strive to do your best. But, but it, it's too demanding to expect perfection in yourself. And it does some good to recognize them and not start trying to go around kidding people about them. Getting the message out. Uh, you've done a, a very high profile thing to get the message out on giving. Why and uh, where do you think it's going to lead? And then I want to ask Jay, very different audience, how do you get the message out on the importance of philanthropy on uh, helping people so they can have the opportunities you had? Absolutely. Well, the way I got the message out was to get a copy of Forbes and look down that 400 list and start making phone calls. Thank and, you. <laughs> and Bill Gates and Belinda did the same thing. And, and we, 
We've only called 80 or so people so far, and some of them I know, some of them I don't know. Uh, and amazing, uh, we've gotten way better reception. To some extent, we, we high-graded the mine, as they say, in the mining business, so we, we picked people in many cases, but not all cases, where we knew that they had a pretty strong philanthropic uh, interest. But uh, it was very low-key, and we just uh, asked them if they would uh, uh, sign a pledge, not legal, but moral that they would give away at least half of their net worth, either during their lifetimes or at, or, or at death. And, and about half of the people that we called, maybe slightly over half, have said they'd be delighted. And we've asked them to tell their own story. And the stories are fascinating. I mean, how people got to that decision, uh, how they evolved, how their family was involved in it, how maybe personal experiences had shaped that. But it was really very, very encouraging. I don't think you'd find that in any other society in the world other than the United States. And uh, uh, we'll see how far it goes, but if it will go further. But even if it only went as far as it's gone, it, it, it will have an impact. Uh, see. So you think that even though even those who were giving are now, in effect, in their minds, upping it? I, I think, it, it, certainly in some cases, I, I know that's the case. And the very fact of getting involved and spending more time thinking about it, talking with your family more about it, I don't think it ever leads to reduced giving, and I think sometimes it, it I've, well, I've seen examples of it here, it's led to more. The real interesting thing will be is if it leads to smarter giving over time. We hope to get this group together once a year and, and, and talk about, again, mistakes. But uh, and Do you that. see uh, the same kind of entrepreneurship we see in commerce in philanthropy? I mean, there are a handful of large organizations, and except for Habitat for Humanity and a couple of others, They've been around for decades. Yeah, there's, there's some. It's harder to evaluate. It's not a market system. Right. I mean, you, you can't put out a P and L at the end of the year, and you can't measure things. You know, I don't believe in measuring quarterly results in business, but, but the the timetable on many things is much longer in, in philanthropy. So it's not as easy a game to me as, as as business, but it's an important game and and. The fact that you can't do it perfectly does not mean that you should sit on the sidelines, and it does not mean you can't learn from others. I, I will, I've already learned something from the three or four dinners we've had and talking to people, but the stories are, are, are interesting. People do, they do things that are amazingly effective. They do things that where they, they bomb for one reason or another, but uh, we will have smarter philanthropy in this country 10 and 20 years from now, I think, than we have now, and I think in a small way, this will contribute to it. So keep publishing the list so I, I can milk it. <laughs> <laughs> JJ will soon be on it. But uh, <laughs> Jay, uh, in terms of uh, philanthropy, uh, obviously you're very much focused on your business right now, as Warren was on his for, for a long time. But uh, how do you get the message out to a, a different audience that uh, it doesn't have to even be dollars, it's time? And what your teacher did, taking you and showing you another world, or your mother uh, getting you emotionally with your father uh, in a way in which you could move forward in your life and improve your life. Yeah, I think the first the, the first step for us, because you know, we, as far as entertainers, we're like the first generation to really capitalize off our talent. For many years, you know, artists were, uh, they were dying broke because the record company took advantage of him in some way, form, shape, and up, right? We, this is like that really first generation. I mean, from where we're from. I'm not talking about the rock star. I'm not talking about vinyl. <laughs> um, so the, the first thing for us, for me, I believe, is to lead by example and show, and show how these things have an effect on people's lives in a real way. And, um, and to tell that story of this is the neighborhood that made me. And I know there's future generation of uh, stars in this neighborhood as well that we must help out as well you know if given the opportunity you know uh, someone what someone can be if given the opportunity so my first thing is to show by example and then I'm a slowly pulley guy like you know me and Puff made it um, I think we could have done more I think we could have visited and, and been there closer but we've made uh, a huge pledge to uh, you know Katrina together mm -hmm. You know, we, well, you know, when we did that uh, united uh, front and we made a donation together, it showed um, hip-hop, that sort of power, how we can get together and do these uh, 
sorts of things. So again, my first thing is to do it by example and show it how it works and show the example of, you know, how opportunity change people's lives and, you know, we'll move forward from there. And uh, looking uh, both forward and backwards, um, when you think of certain people of the past, like uh, philanthropy, Andrew Carnegie, steel, big steel man, first billionaire, but great public works, libraries. Uh, Warren, 50, 100 years from now, when people say Warren Buffett, what words, handful of words, do you want to have come to mind? They'll probably say Berkshire Hathaway. <laughs> I hope it's still around and doing very well, too. <laughs> if it isn't, I'll come back and haunt him. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I, what I've done has not been very complicated, or I mean, I've followed somebody else's teachings. And, but what I really hope, if you, you could pick one word, it would be teacher. I mean, I, I, I got enormous amount. I mean, Jay has talked about his sixth grade teacher. I think almost anyone that's been successful has had a teacher, maybe not a formal teacher. I mean, it can, you know, it can be a parent, obviously, uh, but somebody's had a teacher that's affected them. And, and, and it, if you can pass that along, uh, I think that's better than money, actually. Jay? Uh, uh, how, how? Man, um... Because in some uh, senses you're a I, pioneer. Yeah, I, I, I think a lot is, I hope to inspire, like, I guess Obama took this thing already, but, you know, <laughs> just the hope of, you know, how far we can make it and the hope of, you know, if you really apply yourself and uh, stay true to who you are, you know, how far you can come from where you come from, you know, because my s sort of success, I mean, where I'm from is like... Jay is teaching all the time. I mean, yeah, I mean, he, he's, he's right. teaching a lot bigger classroom than I'll ever teach, and, and it's, a, you know, it's important. I mean, right. they're going to learn from somebody, you know, a young person growing up, and, you know, the, the, he's the guy to learn from. So just the hope, you know, and hope... And, I think uh, that, that that's uh, crucial, especially as people begin to recognize, yes, you're a fantastic artist, but unlike artists of the past, you also knew how to take control of your destiny by learning about business, learning about distribution, all the innards of production, so that uh, you weren't going to lose what you created. Hey. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank Steve. you.